Hello, hello there and welcome back to War Thunder to the ship review on the Admiral Graf Spee and this is a ship that I wanted to see in War Thunder for quite a while but not under the circumstances and this is kind of the summary of the ship's position in the game right now together with the Premium Prince Eugen and the Tech Tree Admiral Hipper with support of some other ships like the Köln and Nürnberg this is by far the strongest top tier top battle rating lineup that there is throughout War Thunder. I have the gameplay to prove it, I have the statistics to prove it and for the history we have an extended 5 minute guide by Trakinifel. Well it's actually more like 15 minutes but I mean who cares. So this ship carries the biggest guns in the game 11 inch or 283 millimeter and they are evil, they are brutal, they are highly efficient. With such a high caliber, also a few down things come into, or a few bad things come into the game. And so how to bridge the reload? Well, first of all, with angling the ship. Second of all, with the heaviest array of secondary batteries that the game has to offer. How useful they are has to be seen. But also I have the statistics for them prepared, which gets into a new era of also looking at the secondary armament. The first ship ever that I looked at the secondary armament was the Krasny Kafkas, and it is more or less the same case. On the other hand, this ship has considerable turret armor, so the turrets don't get knocked out with every single HE hit which is a big advantage in contrast to a lot of the heavier Russian cruisers and also the Pensacola. So without further ado, let's get right into it and I'll see you later in the hangar. I hope you enjoy the 15 minute guide by Drakinifel. The Admiral Graf Spee was the last Deutschland class Panzerschiff built. Named after Admiral Maximilian von Spee, the commander of the East Asia Squadron in World War I, that had fought the battles of Coronel and the Falkland Islands, where he was killed in action. The ship was laid down in October 1932 and completed by January 1936. Although nominally under the 10,000 long tons limitation imposed by the Treaty of Versailles, the full load displacement turned out to be over 16,000 long tons, so just a little bit of budging had gone into the paperwork there. By the time she was completed, the overall top speed achievable had increased to 28 knots, which meant that only the British battlecruisers could outrun and outgun her, although the Dunkirk class was almost immediately started by the French to be capable of the same kind of performance. As with the other ships of her class, the primary armament was six 11-inch guns in two triple turrets, with a secondary battery of eight 5.9-inch guns in single turrets grouped to midships. But by the time World War II broke out, her specific anti-aircraft battery had been upgraded, the 88mm guns originally installed being replaced by six 105mm guns, four 37mm guns and ten 20mm guns. The ship still carried its pair of quadruple torpedo launchers on the stern, but had also received the SeaTact radar set, the first German warship to be equipped with radar equipment. The ship was originally ordered to replace the pre-dreadnought battleship Braunschweig and commissioned into the German Navy as the flagship. In summer of 1936, she headed to the Atlantic to participate in three non-intervention patrols off the Republican-held coast of Spain, and once this was done, she stopped by Great Britain in 1937 to represent Germany at the coronation review for King George V. The sixth. After that, it was back to Spain for a fourth patrol, then following some quick fleet maneuvers and a visit to Sweden, a fifth and final patrol in February 1938. This was then succeeded by goodwill visits to various foreign ports, more fleet maneuvers and a German fleet review. But with the clouds of war looming in 1939, the ship departed on a cruise to the South Atlantic. In hindsight, the comparisons between the ship and its namesake were somewhat eerie, the Graf Spee leaving Germany before the outbreak of the war, and in the event, would never return home. Following the official outbreak of World War II, the ship was ordered to start commerce raiding, but was instructed to strictly adhere to prize rules, which required raiders to stop and search ships for contraband before sinking them, and to ensure that their crews were safely evacuated. The ship also had additional orders to avoid combat, even with inferior opponents, and to frequently change position. This was because Germany lacked a large surface navy, and it was held that it was better to sink more merchant ships and stay intact, than hamper these activities with actual combat, 
which might cause damage even if the fight was won, which would impair its main mission, which was to sink merchant ships. Graf Spee's wartime campaign started off fairly well, evading the British heavy cruiser HMS Cumberland, and finding and sinking the cargo ship Clement off the coast of Brazil. Whilst the captain and chief engineer were taken prisoner, the rest of the crew were allowed to abandon ship and left in their lifeboats. Captain Langsdorff sent a distress call so that they could be picked up, but in the event they were not actually found by another ship, but happily the British crew of the lifeboats later reached the Brazilian coast simply by sailing there in said lifeboats. By the start of October, the British and French navies had formed a total of eight groups to try and hunt the ship down. The carriers Hermes, Eagle, Ark Royal and Bairn were in participation, along with the battlecruiser Renown and the French battleships Dunkirk and Strasbourg, plus 16 assorted heavy and light cruisers. Of these, Force G, commanded by Commodore Henry Harwood, was assigned to the east coast of South America, comprising the heavy cruisers Cumberland and Exeter, and the light cruisers Ajax and Achilles. The Cumberland was sent to patrol off the Falkland Islands, while the other three cruisers patrolled off the River Plate. Happily ignorant of these events, the Graf Spee continued her campaign, capturing the steamer Newton Beach for use as a prisoner transport, and sinking the steamer Ashleya. She would then sink the Newton Beach because the ship turned out to be too slow to keep up and the prisoners were transferred to the Graf Spee herself. A bit later she captured the steamer Huntsman, but since she was now full of prisoners they sent the ship off to rendezvous with the Altmark. The Graf Spee would then rendezvous later that week with the supply ship Altmark and the Huntsman. All prisoners were transferred to the Altmark and then the Huntsman was sunk as well. The first part of her South Atlantic campaign was rounded out by sinking the steamer Trevanian, but since the Allied shipping activity was getting quite intense in the South Atlantic, Captain Langsdorff sailed to the Indian Ocean. Now, by this point, the Graf Spee had sailed for over 30,000 nautical miles and was in bad need of an engine overhaul, which was limiting her top speed. Nevertheless, she would then go on to sink the tanker Africa Shell, and stopped an unidentified Dutch steamer, but decided not to sink her. Having decided the South Atlantic had calmed down enough, the Graf Spee was back in mid-November to refuel from the Altmark. Whilst they were replenishing their supplies, the crew built a second dummy gun turret on the forward part of the ship and put a second dummy funnel behind the aircraft catapult to alter her silhouette to make her look at long distance as if she was an allied ship. Using the ship's Arado float plane, they located the merchant ship Doric Star, followed by the steamer Tyroa, and finally the Strion Shala. All of these ships were sunk, but the Doric Star managed to get out a distress call that prompted Force G to move its squadron cruisers to the mouth of the River Plate. Unfortunately, after Stirling service in September, the Arado floatplane broke down and couldn't be repaired. Now knowing that enemy ships could be seen only shortly before they entered firing range, the ship's disguise was removed so as not to hinder the ship in battle. The next morning at 5.30, Lookout spotted masts off the starboard bow. Initially, this was thought to be the escort for a convoy that had been mentioned in documents recovered from the Thai rower. However, shortly thereafter, it was identified to be the HMS Exeter, accompanied by a pair of smaller warships which were initially identified as destroyers. Despite those initial orders to avoid combat, Captain Langsdorff decided he wasn't going to flee, and so ordered his ships to battle stations, and to close at maximum speed. He realised a little bit too late that he was actually facing three cruisers, but decided to keep closing anyway. Now this strategy might seem odd when you think, oh well he's got 11 inch guns, surely he could destroy them out of the effective range of 6 and 8 inch guns. But the fact was, with the Graf Spee's engines desperately in need of an overhaul, he knew the British cruisers had a 4 to 6 knot speed advantage, and they could in principle stay out of range if they chose to do so, whilst calling for reinforcements. By closing the range early in the battle, he would at least have a prolonged period in which he could try and sink them, and his ship was ultimately more heavily armed and more heavily armoured than any of his opponents. Commodore Harwood had planned for this kind of eventuality, and the ships executed their battle plan. The Exeter turned to the northwest, while the Ajax and Achilles turned to the northeast, attempting to bracket the Graf Bay and force it to spread its fire. The Graf Spee opened fire with the 11-inch guns at Exeter, and with the secondary battery at Ajax and Achilles. 
given the rapidly shortening range, it wasn't long before the British and New Zealand cruisers returned a favour. From the outset, the Graf Spee's gunfire proved to be fairly accurate, straddling the Exeter with her third salvo. The first near miss by an 11 inch shell, just short of the Exeter, managed to kill the ship's torpedo tube crews with splinters, damaged communications, and searchlights, and wrecked the poor old walrus float plane just as it was about to take off to do gunnery spotting. A few minutes later, another 11 inch shell scored a direct hit on B turret putting it out of action. The shrapnel from this hit killed or wounded all the bridge personnel except for the captain and two other officers, and the ship's internal communications were completely wrecked. From now on, steering the ship had to be done by a chain of messengers to the manual steering position at the back of the ship, which hampered the Exeter's manoeuvrability. Ajax and Achilles, meanwhile, had closed the range down to 13,000 yards and started making a zip to cross the Graf Spee's T, which forced her to split her main armament with the forward turret firing at the light cruisers, and as well as the 5.9 inch secondary battery. Shortly thereafter, Exeter would fire two torpedoes from her remaining starboard torpedo tubes, but both of these would miss. The Ajax would launch her spotter float plane, and the Exeter would turn to try and get her port torpedoes in action, but receive two more 11 inch shell hits for her trouble, one hit the, hitting the forward A turret and putting it out of action, the other one hitting the hull and starting fires. At this point Exeter only had her rear turret in action, and that was only under local control as all communications to the fire direction posts had been severed. This led to the rather amusing sight of the turret commander standing on the roof of the turret and yelling instructions through a hatch to those inside. The Exeter was now listing at 7 degrees, with flooding from multiple holes, and being steered only using a small compass rescued from one of the ship's boats. However, at this point a critical blow was scored. Using her two remaining guns, Exeter managed to score a single 8 inch shell hit that penetrated through two decks before exploding near the Graf Spee's funnel. Critically, this destroyed her fuel processing system and left her with just 16 hours of fuel remaining. This was not enough to let her go home. At this point, the Graf Spee had been fighting for about an hour, and although the ship's armour had held up and the ship was in no danger of sinking, the fuel repair system couldn't be repaired whilst under fire, as it was very complex. Two thirds of the anti-aircraft guns and one of the secondary turrets had also been knocked out, and there were no friendly naval bases in reach, and of course no reinforcements. So Captain Langsdorff decided to head for the neutral port of Montevideo to try and sort out the damage that his ship had incurred, and hopefully then make it home. However, to get to port, the ship had to go past the Exeter, which was listing heavily to starboard and taking on water, but still happily firing away with its one remaining turret, as well as the Ajax and Achilles peppering the ship with rather ineffectual 6 inch fire. Therefore the Graf Spee had to engage the Exeter again, and after 40 minutes, water, believe it or not, splashed from an 11 inch near miss, short circuited the exposed electrical systems for the last remaining turret, and the Exeter was forced to break off. Whilst it would have been tempting at this point to try and finish off the annoying British heavy cruiser, the Ajax and Achilles were continuing to bombard the ship, and that drew the Graf Spee's attention as a potential threat. Ajax would close and try to fire torpedoes, but received an 11 inch hit to her X turret for her troubles, which put it out of action, and also jammed Y turret, leaving her with only her forward guns remaining. Shortly after this, another 11 inch shell destroyed the Ajax's mast, and tactics were changed. The British deciding to try and attack at night, where visibility would be much reduced, and use torpedoes against the ship, which was quite clearly practically immune to the 6 inch fire of Ajax and Achilles. Therefore, the two combat capable British cruisers began to fall back and shadow the ship, whilst Com Commodore Harwood was signalling the Cumberland to come for assistance, and the Admiralty was ordering every ship within 3,000 miles to proceed to the River Plate for the same purposes. As the sun set, just before 9 o'clock, the four ships had been fighting for pretty much the entire day, and the Graf Spee entered Montevideo, with a total of 108 men killed on both sides, 36 on Graf Spee and the remainder on the British and New Zealand ships. Once in port, it was discovered that most of the hits scored by the British cruisers had caused only minor damage, but the diesel purification plant being destroyed, along with the desalination plant and galley, were significant problems. 
A hole in the bow would also affect her seaworthiness should she encounter heavy seas. Finally, there was the issue that the ship had fired off of the vast majority of its ammunition. Repairs were estimated to take about two weeks. Unfortunately, the ship only had 72 hours before she would be interned for the duration of the war due to neutrality restrictions surrounding the neutral ports. Meanwhile, although the HMS Cumberland was nearby and ready to replace the Exeter, the Admiralty was broadcasting a series of signals on frequencies known to be intercepted by German intelligence. These and other operations at nearby ports implied that the carrier Ark Royal and battlecruiser Renown were about to arrive, when in fact they were almost two and a half thousand miles away. Believing the British reports, Langsdorf discussed his options with Berlin. These basically amounted to try and seek refuge in Buenos Aires, or scuttle the ship in the plate estuary. Since Captain Langsdorff was under no illusions as to whether or not he could successfully fight the HMS Renown, he decided to scuttle his ship. On the 18th of September, with only Langsdorff and 40 other men aboard, the ship began to move out of Montevideo, and with a crowd of about 20,000 watching, expecting the ship to be moving out for battle against the reinforced British squadron, since the Cumberland by this point had managed to arrive. Instead, just after reaching the edge of territorial waters, massive explosions from scuttling charges and munitions set about the ship sent jets of flame high into the air and created a large cloud of smoke that obscured the ship which began to settle in the shallow water and would burn for the next two days. Whilst the ship's crew were then taken to Argentina, where they would be interned for the remainder of the war, tragically Captain Langsdorff decided to shoot himself whilst in full dress uniform and lying on the ship's battle ensign in his hotel room. The wreck would be partially broken up in 1942 to 1943, although parts of the ship are still visible since the wreck is at a depth of only 11 metres. In 2004, other parts of the ship were raised as it was beginning to become a hazard to navigation. Some of these parts can be seen in Uruguay today. The vast majority of prisoners captured by the Grasch Bay would be held on the supply ship Altmark, which would attempt to make its own way home to Germany, but would be captured off the Norwegian coast by HMS Cossack, freeing these prisoners to return to Britain. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. So, welcome back to the port, and now, as usual, let's begin to have a look at the ship in more detail with the armor, and we begin with the belt. The middle belt is all around 100 millimeters around the citadel, and the bow is protected by some 18 millimeters, and this is just indicating a distributed armor scheme. At the back of the ship, we have 45 millimeters, so kiting away from the enemy instead of going bow in is more efficient if you want to angle the armor. And the next thing is, if we then uh, remove this uh, outer belt protection, we can see that the bulkheads at the front and the rear of the ship are 100 millimeters, and there is an inner spaced armor protection of 40 millimeters, protecting the magazines and the vital inner parts of the machinery, and also a bit of the upper parts of the ship. Then let's come to the turrets and their protection in terms of the barbette is nice, 125 mm. Not the strongest armor, but it's good enough so that your ship doesn't really get uh, um, to experience the turret loss scenario too often, especially when it gets banned by HE shells or at longer ranges from 6 inch armor piercing, you can withstand this with ease. High velocity. 8-inch guns, especially from the other German cruisers, Tech 3 and Premium alike, and also from other Admiral Graf Spies, they just go through this like butter through a hot knife. Then let's come to the turret face, and it is uh, rather flat, 140 mm, and it's rolled cemented armor, and uh, so the magazine, um, the gun mountings are also 160 millimeters so this is quite nice the upper part here is nicely angled and the side is somewhere between 60 and 80 millimeters which is also nice for deflecting some of the shells and then the conning tower has 150 millimeters of protection so you don't lose control over your ship all that often it's also a relatively small target and when you angle it in large parts the bridge um, can more or less hide behind the main turret so you leave so you lose the control over your ship in terms of steering even less often 
Then the next thing is the secondaries as well as here the heavy anti-aircraft. They are not really protected, but they are more or less either single or double mountings. So you can lose some of them and it doesn't really matter too much. And uh, then the deck protection is 18 millimeters, but there below is also a deck. And it is, depending where you are, 40 or 30 millimeters. So it's not really that strong. And it is also not really that efficient at withstanding plunging HE fire, if you will. But again, it's better than nothing. So the ship has some nice protection. It is more or less uh, mediocre. Uh, some light cruisers have even better protection, but it's by no means bad. On the other hand, the turrets are a huge target together with the barbettes. And as we can see, also the magazines are right at the waterline and they are huge. Again, directly below the main turrets but we also have the secondary armaments again just below the waterline or at the waterline and so the ship very often detonates when getting shot with armor piercing which the magazines don't react too nicely to overall solid ship but it's a bit more about the rest of the statistics especially when it comes to the guns so let's get on with the show so finally, after 21 minutes of waiting, we finally have arrived at the statistics. The rundown of the statistics, the comparison that you all have been patiently waiting for. And there we can see that the Admiral Graf Spee has to face the other 5.7 cruisers in comparison. In particular, the amusing part is here the comparison with the HMS Hawkins. I think this is the worst joke that Gaijin has pulled on Great Britain, period. And they share, again, the same battle rating of 5.7. And immediately we can see that the Admiral Graf Spee has the least amount of total guns with only six, but due to the wing turret design layout of the HMS Hawkins, it also has only six gun per broadside effectively. But it's really the caliber that is outstanding on the Admiral Graf Spee. 283 millimeters, 11 inches, or in other words, the 28,3 cm 52SKC28. And those guns have overall an ammunition amount of 720 rounds, but this is sufficient for every single given engagement because your readout is so long. 26.3 seconds. That is 30% longer than even the USS Pensacola. But as we could see in the statistical comparison of the armor, that it has the advantage in comparison to the Kirov, the Pensacola and the Mugami, that the turrets are sufficiently well enough protected, in particular versus HE spam. On the other hand, that uh, combination of not a lot of amount of guns and very long reload creates by far the worst DPM in game. 13.7 that is merely a third of the HMS Hawkins which doesn't have a good TPM to begin with and so this is the big downside we'll come to this because the Admiral Graf Spee has actually one ace upon its sleeve and this is that it can play around this long reload in two different ways then let's talk about the torpedoes and the torpedoes has a uh, two quadruple launches at the very back of the ship so very good for kiting away and also the firing angles over overall are pretty good we have eight g7a torpedoes 533 millimeters of uh, diameter or caliber if you will and they are more or less average maximum range 14 kilometers and 56 kilometers per hour with the torpedo mod so they are okay-ish, but they are just not the wall of skill that, for example, the Mogami can produce. But at least you have them, which is something that the USS Brooklyn and USS Pensacola in particular are missing. Now, the overall displacement is 16,320 tons. Only second to here the Prinz Eugen and the Admiral Hippo, of course. So I think that this can... Um, result in the ship soaking up a lot of damage especially with the distributed armor scheme and also due to the uh, big crew complement of 1175 which is again only second to the Prince Eugen with a whopping nearly 1800 so the ship also has a rather low top speed of 53 kilometers per hour and so even the HMS Hawkins is faster but trust me, speed will not win you the game in some sort of cruise engagements. It's about the gun firepower.
Overall, the Admiral Graf Spee has access to three different shell types for its main batteries and the first stock high explosive shell is the 28cm Sprenggranate L4,4 Kopfzünder Hochexplosiv. This is a massive 300kg heavy warhead traveling at a whopping 910 meters per second being some of the fastest mass velocity guns in the game right now and delivering a massive 23.33 kilogram bursting charge to the enemy blasting straight through even three inch belt armor clean causing massive leaks massive flooding massive fire massive crew loss the effect of those shells can be seen and uh, in effect in the gameplay in the background and it just pulverizes even the strongest cruisers that we currently have in game only the reload and the lack of dpm are some sort of balancing factors but it doesn't really help because with the first hit an enemy ship can go down and uh, this is really really nasty they are the shell types that have fire in like 80 percent of the engagements even against other graf spees even against prince eugen kiros hawkins pensacola mogami brooklyn whatever comes my way I just blasted away with those massive 11 inch high explosive shells. This is the primary shell type. The second shell type is actually a tier 1 modification upgrade and it is the APCVC or 28cm Panzersprenggranate L4,4 APBC. It is again a 300kg heavy massive warhead traveling at again 910 meters per second and delivering a 7.84 kilograms of TNT equivalent heavy warhead and it can punch clean through over 540 millimeters at point blank range or a thousand meters and also even at 10 kilometers we're looking at 372 millimeters of penetration and even above 15 kilometers you can punch clean through 300 millimeters with ease so the overmatch mechanics the caliber um, the penetration the mass velocity it all has it and i think that this shell type is a pretty good shell but it gets even better because the third shell type is actually a tier 2 modification and it is the semi armor piercing ballistic cap 28 cm sprenggranate l4,4 mit bodenzünder semi armor piercing round Again, same statistics in terms of uh, weight of the warhead, caliber, and also the mass velocity of 910 meters per second. The bursting charge goes up to nearly 17 kilograms. And if you think that you heavily pay in terms of penetration, yes, you sacrifice a little bit, but you still have more than enough for any single engagement. 470 millimeters of penetration at point blank range dwarfs any other shell type even from the high mass velocity Prince Eugen's pure armor piercing the semi armor piercing of the Admiral Graf Spee is still by far better and even at 10 kilometers 321 millimeters of penetration and even at 15 kilometers 281 millimeters again in combination with the shell type with the caliber uh, with the mass velocity you just punch clean through any sort of armor except at the very most angled ones and you deliver massive pain towards the enemy and this is something that was prior only feelable with the Kirov with 10 kilograms of warhead inside of the semi armor piercing shell but you dwarf this by an additional nearly seven kilograms more and so when i have to decide going into battle as the primary shell i use the high explosive and as the second one i use the semi armor piercing round because you have to decide yourself for only two shell types for the main guns so because the ship has such a long reload on its main batteries and you also have only two turrets which also can be knocked out and maybe from the other side there is a destroyer coming around the island you need to help yourself and all the cruisers have, have some sort of uh, either dual purpose or dedicated secondary battery the Admiral Graf Spee has an average amount of eight uh, secondary barrels four per broadside and they are the highest caliber 150 millimeters or 5.9 inch which is the largest caliber in this comparison and those 15 centimeter 55 SKC 28 guns have an overall ammunition capacity of 1600 rounds 
200 per barrel and the reload is the highest the joint highest with 3.75 seconds so that means the dpm is only better than the hms hawkins unsurprisingly with 64 rounds per minute that's not really that impressive but the big difference here is that you have those dedicated long range secondaries and here are the shell characteristics much like the main batteries the secondaries have access to three different shell types we begin with the armor piercing high explosive and it is in fact one of the few cruisers that has access to armor piercing shells for its secondaries despite having 281 millimeters of penetration with a bursting charge of 1.3 kilograms and a relatively high mass velocity of 960 meters per second i wouldn't really use the shell too often because the majority of opponents that you want to fight with the ship are either patrol boats or destroyers and for them the stock high explosive shell is better suited obviously and it is still a cruiser grade caliber of 5.9 inches 37 millimeters of high explosive blast penetration nearly four kilograms of tnt equivalent warhead traveling at 835 meters per second so this is now a uh, noticeably slower mass velocity but it still hits hard and it again can reach targets effectively at seven plus kilometers then we have the special shell in this case it's yet another semi-armor piercing and it is 247 millimeters of penetration and also delivering a bursting charge now in contrast to the first APHE of 3.3 kilograms which is significantly more lethal and uh, again a muscle velocity of 960 meters per second a uh, further addition to note here is that those are not dual purpose guns they are dedicated anti-ship weapons and so they don't fire at aircraft um, except if you overtake the control manually but on the other hand you have also heavy anti-aircraft batteries you have two-thirds of the dpm and overall firepower per broadside than the prinz eugen because you also have its heavy anti-aircraft batteries in addition to this but again the anti-aircraft uh, defense capabilities of the ship are rather weak and so this is its big achilles heel so now let's sum up the ship let's begin with the cons the ship is pretty slow the ship is not really that maneuverable the ship has lackluster anti-aircraft firepower it doesn't have a turtle back array it doesn't have good dpm and also it doesn't have the very best torpedoes although they are still usable what are the pros you still have good enough armor point number one you have the highest caliber guns therefore you make up for the lack of dpm with the highest alpha strike and very reliable firepower due to the turrets being armored and you also have the heaviest secondaries if everything goes south so the ship is very good and in a ship versus ship duel it is pretty fearsome but on the other hand you also can explode quite regularly which in fact i experienced myself quite often when getting shot by admiral hipper admiral graf spee and also Prinz eugen and other cruisers including something like a kirov chapayev or whatever the armor protection on the ship is not really foolproof and so there you have it this is the absolute king of long-range artillery duels it is really powerful i love the ship and i wanted to see it it's just a shame that we again have here the king of overpoweredness for one or two patches and i am really against the addition of the ship in this patch i think that other nations should have gotten really better performing high, um, heavy cruisers including the japanese the americans and in particular the british as well surprisingly enough the soviets this is too much for the germans although i love to play german ships fly german aircraft once in a while and also play german tanks because i think they have a style factor i am more interested in the overall balance in the game and this is not given and this is too much for the for this patch on the other hand i have to say that i am not really feeling that guilty to have such a good time in the ship it is awesome and when it works it's just the best that war thunder can deliver i always wanted to have big guns in the game and they certainly deliver they bring pain and destruction 
uh, over the enemy and this is exactly what I expect from it. And it has dedicated weaknesses and it also can still be countered by any other ship in the game. But on the other hand, once you have the range set, then there is no tomorrow for the enemy. So I think that this ship should be played angled at long range. You can de desynchronize your turrets. You can, if you choose so, to use the secondaries uh, in close quarters engagements or when you get surprised or whatever. The ship has many tools. It's very interesting to play and I love this factor. But again, it's too much in conjunction with the Prince Eugen and the Admiral Hipper, etc. I think that uh, this patch is really the glory time of the German Navy. I think that we will never see days like we see in this patch. And now finally, after 35 minutes of talking and statistics and history on the ship, that's finally it for me today. I hope that you enjoyed the rundown of the statistics. I hope that you enjoyed the informative part, the gameplay, and also, as usual, in this case, the 15-minute guide by Drakinifel about the historical career of the ship. That's it for me today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Please give this video a like if you did. Subscribe if you want to see more. And as usual, we will see each other on the battlefields, in the skies, and on the waves of War Thunder.